Oh, thank you everyone for, for coming and, and joining us here today. Uh, we're glad that we've had pretty much a, a max crowd here in the, at ODI with us, as well as about another 200 online. Um, if we can now switch over to the presentation, please. Hopefully there's nothing inappropriate written in the comments box there on the, uh, on the slides. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, to, to all the panelists for, for joining us today and especially to, to Ann Grant for agreeing to uh, join us as, as the chair of, of today's event. Uh, for those of you who are here in the room with us, you'll have a copy of the final report on humanitarian crises, emergency response and preparedness, the role of business in the private sector, sitting there on your chair for you. Uh, however, for those of you, those 200 or so of you who are joining us out there uh, in about 20 countries around the world, we strongly encourage you to go to uh, odi.org right now and to uh, download a copy a copy of the report so that you uh, get a better sense of what we're, what we're launching here today. Um, however, before I go any further, I'd really like to draw attention to all the different stakeholders who have been involved in this project, including many of the panelists, but including many of you actually out in the, the audience as well, uh, both here and, and virtually elsewhere in the world. This project itself was actually a humanitarian uh, private sector partnership involving not only the humanitarian policy group here at ODI and the humanitarian futures program at King's College uh, led by Randolph Kent, uh, but also Vantage Partners, a, a dynamic consultancy based out of Boston uh, that provided uh, technical expertise throughout the course of the project and which uh, is responsible for that two-page summary of the, of the findings that you have there on each of your, your seats here. Um, in addition, this project was conducted in extremely close collaboration with Helena Fraser and her team uh, at the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, uh, which has been an exceptionally fruitful partnership and one that's allowed this project not only to include uh, perspectives of people here in, in London and in Geneva and New York and elsewhere, but also really to, to connect with the right people uh, that OCHA and the UN are partnered with uh, in the many countries where we conducted the research for this project. In addition, it goes without saying that this project wouldn't have been possible without the support from the UK Department for National Development, uh, which has been the, the donor for this project and, and a great partner in, in conducting the, the research as well. So it's been, a, it's been a big tent with a lot of different sorts of actors involved in this project with different perspectives from the private sector, the research community, and elsewhere. Uh, so it gave us some, some hands-on experience with trying to navigate uh, humanitarian private sector partnerships. This study took place, it was a global study, however I think it's important to note that this final report that we're here to launch today really builds off of the four country case study reports, uh, which included field-based work in Kenya, Jordan, and Indonesia, as well as a desk-based analysis of looking at what's been going on in Haiti between the private sector and humanitarian aid agencies. Um, it, these countries were chosen generally given their strong degree of the strong private sectors, the strong markets, um, and the fact that these were some countries where we had examples of businesses collaborating with aid agencies, as well as some places such as Jordan, in fact, where it was more exploratory, where we wanted to see in the context of something like the Syria refugee crisis, how are businesses and aid agencies operating either in, in partnership or in a, in a common direction towards alleviating suffering among, among the Syrian refugee population. So this project not only included these four case studies, uh, as well as global workshops and consultations in Geneva, meetings here in London, and, and numerous events with representatives of the private sector and aid agencies and, and others. Um, and in the course of all this data collection in the field here in London and Geneva, and elsewhere, we spoke with more than 250 different stakeholders representing the private sector, uh, NGOs, UN agencies, the Red Cross, Red Crescent Movement, donor entities, you name it, we spoke with them. Uh, tried to really include as many perspectives as we possibly could, including really pursuing actively uh, the perspectives of numerous stakeholders in the bu business community who provided uh, exceptionally useful insights into the research and really helped us understand 
not only what sorts of partnerships they're engaged with and what sorts of humanitarian activities they're engaged with, uh, but also how they understand humanitarian action. What are their interests? What are their motives? What drives them to get involved in this, in this field and to contribute to humanitarian objectives either through the lens of corporate social responsibility and pro bono and charitable collaborations or on a much more commercial basis. And I think that really one of the most exciting things that has emerged from this project really is that commercial side. And that's something we'd like to talk about a lot today. Uh, as the, uh, speakers were chatting before the event started, really talking about, you know, is, is the time for CSR gone? Is that behind us? Is there something better we can be doing, more scalable and more sustainable? If we kind of take off the CSR lens, we take off the charitable, we take off the pro bono lens, and we start thinking more um, with business people and, and like business people. Um, so we also wanted, before really delving into some of the meat of the, of the session, to very clearly state that uh, the role of the private sector in humanitarian work is, is nothing new. And even though we're launching this report, and even though we hear so much these days about the role that businesses are playing in humanitarian action, in disasters, and so on, this is in fact something that has been going on for, for decades, if not centuries. And I think many of us here in this room who have dealt, in, dealt with conflicts, disasters, and other crises constantly say that businesses are often among the first responders to any crisis opening their stores, opening their warehouses, volunteering their, their trucks and their machinery and their equipment to clear roads and to get materials and supplies into affected areas. And not only contributing to the aid efforts, but also doing things that oftentimes go far under acknowledged in relation to humanitarian action. In a world in which aid agencies are increasingly relying upon cash transfer programs to reach disaster affected populations, simply helping to get a market in a far flung community up and running again is a key part of the humanitarian enterprise because it actually allows those humanitarian act activities, those cash transfer programs and so on to move forward. So we're talking both about kind of the overtly humanitarian and the implicitly humanitarian activities that, uh, that many companies are, are involved with. And before handing it over to Randolph, I just wanted to mention one thing about you know, what we're talking about today isn't a fad. I think in the course of the study quite a bit, we encountered people who said, Right, right, okay, this is gonna be something else. You know, it'll be a fad, we'll talk about you know, humanitarian, private sector engagement. Okay, we're gonna see the nth initiative to try to get businesses more involved in, in disasters and conflicts and crises, and then it'll fall by the wayside again. And, uh, or it'll become mainstreamed and we'll add a tick box on our proposals that we considered how we'd work with the private sector and move on. Uh, but one of the things we really wanna emphasize is that in the future, opportunities for engaging with businesses in humanitarian action are only going to increase if for a number of reasons, including the fact that many of the challenges that we're increasingly facing as a result of climate change, as a result of pandemics, technological failures, um, and so on, are things where businesses have a real competitive advantage. You know, we're not just going, we're still gonna be dealing with the natural disasters, we're still gonna be dealing with the droughts, we're still gonna be dealing with the floods and the conflicts, but we're also going to see an entirely new breed of exceptionally daunting challenges arise that aid agencies on their own aren't necessarily equipped to, to handle, and where we will need to rely on the capabilities and capacities of the private sector. In addition, we oftentimes see that many countries, especially middle-income countries, which tend to be increasingly protective of their sovereignty, are pursuing collaborations with the private sector rather than with traditional aid agencies because they want to ensure that the response to that crisis actually helps them further their pursuit of economic growth and enterprise development. So we're also seeing a lot of governments, especially as more countries reach middle income status, getting excited about these issues. And you know, we look back to a situation like Cyclone Nargis in Myanmar, and even though we, we look back and we think, well, they pulled in ASEAN to let all the traditional aid agencies in, but what we don't see is actually the government's first call for assistance wasn't to the international community, wasn't to ASEAN, it was to the Burmese business community, saying, you know, we want to enlist you in responding to this crisis. And we're gonna be seeing this a lot more, especially after phenomenal examples like we recently saw in the case of Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, where businesses engaged on, a, on an unprecedented scale, not only as, as partners, but also as donors in one of the very rare cases of, of the private sector really turning out to be a, a major donor in these crises. 
And lastly, I think one of the, just before I hand it over to Randolph, I think one of the more interesting messages that we also heard from quite a few people in the course of this study um, was that you know, the situation was getting increasingly ripe for businesses in crises because some countries were fed up about the way they were being portrayed at times by traditional aid agencies as part of fundraising pitches and drives in the aftermath of, of conflicts and disasters. This image of a devastated country in shambles, unsuited for, unsuited for foreign direct investment, actually hurt the country's long-term growth at the same time as it was attracting additional donor resources to the country. So I think there's a sense that by engaging more with businesses, there's a, cha there's a better opportunity to balance not only the short term humanitarian needs, uh, but also to combine those with longer term strategic thinking about how we can grow an economy in many of these countries. Um, so with that, let me hand it over to co-author Randolph Kent.